And so uh, I'm excited to uh, have celebrated uh, the focus of missions, missionaries, uh, the Great Commission, going to all the world and to all the nations and making disciples and baptizing them, as Matthew 28 uh, talks about. Uh, but I, I've been seeking the Lord about where, where do we go from here? And this is the beauty of the local church. What do we need to hear? What is, what is Stonebridge Church as a local church, as part of the universal church? What is it? What is it that we, that we need to hear? And so uh, as I've been doing a lot of prayer and contemplating and, and, and pondering I, and recognizing this, the continuing trend, and this goes prior to 2020, uh, the continuing trend of our younger generations not being as convinced as maybe some of you were and hopefully are of there being an absolute truth. There, there is such thing as absolute truth. Don't, don't look at me like I got two heads. There is absolute. There is absolute truth. And that is uh, something that is waning in, in our times and in our age. And uh, also that, that this book right here, this is, it says right here on the spine, Holy Bible. This is the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God Almighty. And it's just as, just as sure today in 2021 and all that's going on in this crazy world as it ever, as it ever was, if not even more so. But observing the, those that are walking away from their Christian roots and America, leaving if not going to church anymore. This, of uh, course, this past year and a half of this pandemic, this COVID pandemic. Is everybody sick of talking about the COVID pandemic? I, this COVID pandemic and how it is, how it has brought distraction and disruption and even division in the church with, with the many false gospels that have now made it to the pulpits of America. I'm, I'm grieved in my spirit how it's become such a man-centered gospel. Whether it's the prosperity gospel or, or, or that hyper word of faith gospel or, or the social justice gospel or nationalism gospel. Or, the list goes on and on and on. And, and the problem is it's all of it, all of them, taking the focus away from the one true and only gospel. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the only saving gospel. That, that gospel that some consider foolishness. But to us that are being saved, it's the power of God unto salvation. The cross of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that needs to be coming out of every pulpit in America and across the world. It needs to be coming off the pulpit of your platform that God's given you. And as he's called us to be witnesses in these days. So there's this saying that's been out there by an, an author of a book. And it's not important who he, that author is at all. But what he said is very important. And it comes to this main crux of where I felt uh, the Lord is leading us in, in, in talking about glorified God. The title of this series could be a lot of different things. I came up with to try to, I don't have a cool, trendy, uh, hip name for it. I just glorify God. Glorifying God. God be glorified. You're going to get the point after about eight weeks of this, trust me. But we're talking about this saying that I came across, and I absolutely love it. And it's that... The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing in all of life is to keep the main thing, and that's glorifying God who created you and has given you life right now, the main thing and the main focus, the main, the, the, the main pursuit of our lives. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I just don't want to have so... Uh, so, so much uh, assumptions being made. We, when we talk about the word glory and glorify and glorious, and glor it's, 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 a, it's a major, major, major topic. I realize that. We're just going to be touching the surface. But I'm telling you this morning, and I'm going to be telling you for a lot of Sunday mornings in, in the preceding months, it is the main thing. It is the main thing because uh, we don't want to be making this colossal mistake of exchanging God's glory for another's. And we'll say, well, who, who would possibly do that? Well, a lot of people have been doing it for, for, for a lot of time. Uh, Psalm 106, verses 19 and 20, to, to remind us about how they made a calf. Remember when Moses 
No, no one else wanted to go before the presence of God. And so, Moses, you go up and you hear from him. And, and, and so, in their impatience and their desire for, 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 uh, for all of these things that people are pursuing, these, they, they, they come up and they create this calf. It says, they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molded image. Thus, they, they changed their glory into the image of an ox that eats grass. Can you imagine? You're exchanging. Instead of the glory of God that we're going to hear so much about, I want to exchange it for not even a real ox that eats grass. Just give me an image of a calf. That's all, that's all, that's, that's, that's all they needed. Or Romans, Paul wrote in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, talking about those who are unrighteous. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You say, well, I, I would certainly never create a carved image and exchange that for the glory of God, yet that is sometimes the very thing that we're doing. When we take our eyes off of God and we put our trust in other things, in other people, in other teachings, in other ideas, than the word of God. Because, and I, who are, I don't, I don't, this could be ourselves. We could put our trust in ourselves. We have created ourselves to be the image, this carved image. This. I'm no smarter apart from God than that ox eating grass. I can, I can assure you of, of that. You can, you can evaluate your own level of intelligence and ability. I'll leave that up to you. But, but I am no more than this image of, a, of an ox eating grass eating grass, whether it's other people, maybe it's the world and this offerings, whatever it is, they become these images that distract us and take our eyes off of God and the glory of God. But the truth is that none of these things, none of them produce anything lasting. Every one of them fade away. It's, it's momentary. It's, it's fleeting. It's passing, only offering us temporal, temporal rewards. I love the 115th Psalm. I may work that into this series, I'm not sure, but just verse 1, it says, not unto us, O Lord, not, 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 unto, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your, your truth. These man-centered God, it's not about centering life all around us. That is not going to last. That's going to be momentary. It's going to be fleeting. It's going to be passing. But we need to be Christ-centered. In, our, in these pulpits and in our lives and in our, in our witnesses. I've got two theme verses I want to share with you. One comes from the Old Testament. One comes from the New Testament that we will be hearing about in, these, in this series. The first one is Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7. It says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I formed him, yes. I have made him. Now, this, this word glory in the Hebrew language that it's written here is it means honor, reverence, glory as due to someone. And in this case, capital M in the Mize, we're talking about God Almighty. Created for God's glory. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 10 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Here in this Greek language that is written, it means glory means so as to honor God and to promote his glory to all men. To all men. And so uh, for today uh, in this series, I want to focus on the glory of God, glorify God. And today's title is simply, He's Worthy. How many know he's worthy to be glorified this morning? He's worthy to be glorified this afternoon. He, he's worthy to be glorified every moment of our lives. So go with me to the 24th Psalm. I know Psalm 23 gets a lot of attention, and it should, rightfully. But I'm going to go to the 24th Psalm, and this also needs our attention, especially this morning. Psalm 24. Talking about the king of glory and his kingdom. It reads, the earth is the Lord's and all, everybody say all, all its fullness. The world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. 
Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and are of, of a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Let's pray this morning. Father, we pray to the King of glory this morning. There is none other than you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Lord of hosts, commanding all of the armies of heaven. That which is yours is all that you've created. God, we humble ourselves as your creation here this morning, and we do give you glory. We give you glory not just in your house as we're in a church as we are, quote-unquote, supposed to, but we give you glory with our lives, for we read in your word that is the very reason why we were created. And the only way that we will find true fulfillment, joy, happiness, and peace in our lives. So God, I pray that you would give us not just these ears to hear your word, but hearts to receive the seed of the word, the power of the word. Lord, that it'll, that it'll do a work in us and through us, Father, we read that you're, we're not the same. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. And Lord, as you continue to call us forward and call us up, Father, you continue to transform us. This, this power that we talked about, the power of God. Lord, we pray that you do that good work in and through us. We thank you, Lord, for families and Family Sunday. We're, we're, we're grateful to be able to gather as a family in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be in your presence with the fellow saints and brothers and sisters of the Lord. We give you all the glory for everything that is said and done in this house today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I believe this wholeheartedly, whether you're 9 or 99. Now, that doesn't mean if you're under 9, this isn't for you. It is. If you're over 99, it's especially for you, and God bless you. Uh, I mean... <laughs> Uh, uh, my pastor friend Matt Bell uh, just lost uh, what was his oldest elder off his elder board last year. Brother Beatles was 99 years old when he resigned the board of elders, and he just passed away a couple weeks ago at the age of 100 years old. Excuse me, 100 years old, and uh, just an amazing legacy that he left. Served under uh, John Bell, Pastor Benson's mentor, uh, under David Bell, and under uh, um, grandson Matt Bell and, and his brothers. It's, Amazing. So, yes, it's possible. But no matter if you're 9 or 99, educated or uneducated, rich or poor, uh, outgoing or shy, maybe on top of the mountain in life right now, or maybe you find yourself in one of your deepest valleys, this, this topic of glorifying God is going to bring clarity and direction to every one of us that would have the ears to hear what the Word of God says. I want you to just think back with me if you can, or maybe you are a child, so think where you are, but think about even your experiences so far as a, as a child. But those of you that are beyond ch ch childhood, think back when you were a child, maybe through your teenage years, young adult, middle age, and older years, we'll, we'll see a common thread throughout most people's lives as human beings. Especially when, when I'm considering this question, why do people do the things they do? Why do you do the things that you do? Why did you do all those things that you did? Why are you going to do the things that you're going to do? What, what, what is it? What, why? <laughs> this common thread is simply this. From your childhood, right? We're going back into our childhood, working our way through. It's to be happy. It's to feel fulfilled. It's to experience pleasure. It's to enjoy life. And, and, and if people, if human beings are to be left on their own, this is going to be the pursuit of their entire life as long as they are alive here on the earth. This is their complete and total pursuit. We play with our friends as children. Why? Because we have to? No, because it's fun. 
right? We, we want to play with our friends as children, don't we, kids? We go to school to learn stuff, isn't it? It's great to learn stuff. Knowledge is good. Let's ask for God's wisdom so we know what to do with that knowledge. But knowledge is good. We go to school to learn stuff, to get educated. We get a job so that we can make money because you need money to buy things. And you need things to provide for yourself and to, yes, big kids, have some fun. You know, it's all right to have fun. Yeah. Hey, it's okay to have fun. You, 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 can be, you can be holy and righteous and fun. Don't believe the lie of the world that says the only way that you can have fun is to live a life of debauchery. That's not true. You can have, church, you can have fun. God wants you to have fun. Have some fun here this morning, will you please? Help, help the preacher out. <laughs> but we do all these things so that we can live a happy, fulfilled, good life. At least that's what we are told. Thank you. Only your wife would know that your mouth's getting dry. <laughs> but, but as I continue to, to ponder all of what is going on, as I began this, this message, how is all that working out for America? How, how is all, uh, this is, this is, it's like you're, you, you come out of the womb, you're born, you get taken care of, you get shoved into school, you come out of school, you go into a job, you come out of the job, you spend money, you, you just, you, you, sometimes you feel like a robot. But this, this, is, this is what I'm told to do. This is what I'm told to do. This is what I'm told to do. And then you try to convince yourself, that, hey, this is fun. The more I look at the world around me and all that's going on in the world around me, that doesn't look like any fun. That looks miserable. I actually don't want anything to do with it. The only reason I do have something to do with it is because the God that I serve says to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To tell people about there's some good news. Even though you're in the world, don't be of the world. And yes, you can have fun in relationship with me. Because God's original plan certainly was not for mankind to be left on his own. So he'd endlessly pursued an empty, uh, uh, hollow tunnel of, uh, of happiness and fulfillment and goodness. Because man on his own will never find it. It doesn't exist. Now his hope is for all to come to the realization of what life is really all about. At the end of this series, you're going to hear me talk about the point I want to make is what life is all about is to glorify God. That's what life is all about. Your life, your existence, however much fun or not fun you're having, is all about glorifying God. So like I, 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 if the world is listening to this message, they're, they're not going to believe that. I'm not believing it. You don't have to believe it. You don't have to believe it, but I'm telling you it's the absolute truth because it's what this book says. It's an eternal message that will never, ever change. So his hope is for all to come to the realization of what life is really about by receiving the revelation of who he really is to come to the recognition of who we really are and ultimately why we are here. What, what, why, what, what, is, what is this life all about? So realization of what life's all about is about the revelation of who God is so that you can come to the recognition of who you are. Because apart from knowing who God is, you have no chance of coming to the understanding of who you are. Another endless pursuit. Because when it comes to life existence and meaning and purpose and value, you're, you're, when you try to assess your personal, your personal worth, none of these are going to be answered apart from knowing who God is, knowing who you are, and especially apart from knowing God personally. Simply won't be answered. Now for me... It's been so liberating. It's been so liberating. And those of you that know me, you maybe know my, my story, my testimony. Uh, it just keeps getting longer and longer and better and better, doesn't it? Those of you who've been walking with the Lord for a long time, God just continues to pour himself into your life as you receive him. I want more revelation of who God is because I certainly need more recognition of who I am. And, and, and it's just amazing how God continues to do this for us, but a liberating result of knowing who God is for me in my relationship with him is realizing what this life is not about. That which I was pursuing as a vibrant young man 
going to go and conquer the world and wrap it up and wrap it around the tail and shove it in my pocket. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to be rich. I'm... None of that is what life is about. It's about glorifying God with our lives in whatever we do. Glory of God. What is the glory of God anyways? It's just such a big topic. What, what is the glory of God? Because we can use it as an adjective. We can use it as a verb. It's, it's used as a, as a noun. It involves a lot. And, and one thing that it is, it's a comprehensive biblical theme. It's throughout all of Scripture. It's found in every book. It's found in every story. It's found in every doctrine of the Bible. His, we can see this. His glory extends uh, in, in, the, in the great exodus of God's people out of Egypt, in the pillars of the fire and the, and the cloud, in the tabernacle, in the temple, in all the earth, in the heavens, and yes, even in all of his people. And glory throughout the word of God and, and, and our lives, it's identified in Christ, his life on earth, his, his, his crucifixion first, and his resurrection. And it'll be with him in his coming return, one day of judgment and victory. Glory is identified with the Holy Spirit. It's identified with the church. I trust and believe it's identified with Stonebridge Church. The glory of God needs to be identified here because if it's not, I'm going to call, I'll resign. You can keep the doors open if you want. Gary knows this. I'll resign. I'll step back. I'll do something else. If the glory of God is not imminent in Stonebridge Church. Glory as a noun means splendor, magnificence. It's praised, ascribed in adoration and honor. It's the divine presence or the divine perfections or excellence of God. And to exalt, to, gl to glorify is to exalt with joy, to rejoice, to boast, to be proud of God. Bestowing honor, praise, or admiration is to elevate him in his rightful place. We were singing about that this morning. Elevating him in, as, as the throne, on the throne of our lives. It's to give glory in worship as we do when we come together. But the glory of God really, as a general definition, the glory of God is the very essence of who God is. It's his nature and his character. It's his love, it's his mercy and his grace. It's his wisdom, his impartiality and his justness. It's a manifestation of all of his holy and righteous attributes put together. I think it's why no man can see God. We'd be, we'd be devastated. We'd probably implode. We'd probably blow up if we're exposed in these corruptible uh, mortal bodies in the fullness of who God is. The glory of God is found in his presence. It's revealed in his creation. Just look at the majestic heavens. Look at the beauty of this earth. Uh, take the time to watch a sunset to watch a sunrise, we, in our trips back and forth, most recently to Wisconsin, to see the rolling hills of uh, the, the beauty of God's creation with the trees and the colors and the landscape, amazing. Psalm 19, 1, it says that, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And the, hev and the heavens show his handiwork. It's, it's blatantly obvious. And an atheist is, is either blind dumb, a fool, or just simply in rebellion. That's just the truth and honesty. And I speak it in love if there's any atheists within the sound of my voice. It's to be expressed in and through you and me. God's glory is to be expressed in us and through us as image bearers of God. Isn't that what we read in Genesis, the first chapter, in verses 26 and 27? And the Holy Trinity is, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Our lives are meant to be a testimony of his glory. We're designed to be vessels that contain his glory. Be in reflections of that glory. And once redeemed by the blood of Christ, it's his glory that is in us. The Holy Spirit residing in us shining through us, radiating from us and into the world. We were created to respond to God's glory that always was, always will be by simply responding to this glory by glorifying him. As the 24th Psalm brings out, who is this king of glory anyways? There's some in the world who've heard about him, but they 
choose not to care or believe anything that the scriptures say. Others in the world, they don't know who he is. And that's where you and I come in. God would have us to let them know who God is. That's called being a witness. That's giving a testimony. That's declaring the word of God. That's allowing the glory of God to flow in and through us. But let's take a little bit closer look at this 24th Psalm. What what is David? It's a psalm by David. And uh, most scholars believe that it was probably written when the Ark of the Covenant was being coming into uh, into Jerusalem during King David's reign. And so what is what is he saying? It's an amazingly prophetic psalm. When at the time, of course, we're talking in the time of King David, long before the birth of Christ, long before uh, the cross, uh, all of what took place, but he amazingly inspired, not surprisingly, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is talking about the Lord here in this psalm. The earth is the Lord's in its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. He's founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Amazing that regardless of, of the world being fallen and in the chaos that it's in, God owns it. It's his it's in the palm of his hand. And you say, well, how, how can all of this be going on? God is allowing it for a time and a season. And in his sovereignty, one day, God willing, you can be face to face with him and ask him. You can ask him. It has to do with free will. It has to do with choosing to love him and serve him so we can ultimately live with him. But we talk about America's founding fathers, right? We, we talk a lot about that. This church has a founding father, Pastor Robert Martin. This earth has a founder. God is the founder of the earth and all that is in it. He's the one who established it. As we, again, going back to the beginning, Genesis 1 and verses 2 and 9, the earth, it was without form. It, it, was, it was void. Darkness covered the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of, 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 these, of these waters. And that's when he says in verse 9, let the dry land appear. And in the second chapter, seventh verse, when he formed man out of the dust. Amazing. Amazing fellow dust people. God formed man out of the dust of the earth. But the difference between us taking dirt and making clay and forming it into something, he has the ability that you and I do not, and that's breathing life into that created vessel. And that's what he did He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He created it all. He he formed it all. He is the source of life for every living thing. And in its fullness, all who dwell in it, regardless of whether they acknowledge it or not, God has the rightful claim on every person that has ever been conceived on this earth. Who is this king of glory? As verse 3 and 4 move into, who, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, he asks. Who may stand in, in his holy place? This, this God that created it all, and, 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 and it's all his, and, and, and the fullness of it, and all who dwell in it, who could possibly ascend to his position? Who could possibly stand on the same holy ground that he stands on? And then he answers it in verse 4. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn de- deceitfully. Who? possibly could approach the Lord. As I mentioned, people left on their own, they're going to continue to pursue this question. How can I be happy? I just want to be happy. When it comes down to the simplest of terms, from the smallest of the chi- of, as a child to the oldest person left on their own, it's, I just want to be happy. I just, what is it? I, I'm, 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 that's all I want. I just want to know what it is to be happy. And finally, when that Holy Spirit reveals himself to someone, whether it's a child, middle-aged, or older, they respond by faith, and they begin to see themselves in a different light. You remember when you heard the voice of God, when you sensed the tugging of the Holy Spirit in your life, that, that the light of God's presence shined on your life, and you were able to see yourself as the wretched sinner that you are. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's... Not that we had a choice in it. No one come out of the womb saying, I'm a sinner and I want to be separated from God. Of course not. Of course not. But through one man, we know that sin entered into the world. And gratefully, through one man, Jesus Christ, he was able to redeem us 
save us and fulfill that, 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 that gap that was between us and the God that created us. And so we see ourselves in a different light. And then the question changes to not, not, not what, what it is that I can be happy, but what must I do to remain in God's presence? What, what, how is it that I can just, I, I want to remain in God's presence? Because if you've spent any amount of time in the glory of God and in the presence of God, you know that it is more than just happiness. You know that it is joy unspeakable and full of what? God's glory. What a difference. What a difference. So the question changes to what must I do? Well, you, you have to have clean hands. You have to have a, a pure heart. What is, what is David speaking to here? He certainly is talking about our hands. He's talking about our actions. He's talking about the works. Pure heart. He's talking about where do the motives, our motives come from our, our heart. He's talking about our actions. He's talking about our motives, even our, our attitudes. And only one of clean hands and a pure heart can even think about being in the God's glory. The only one who, of course, qualifies as we know now, and whether David realized it or not, but he was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only, the, the only one who qualifies to stand before the God of creation, the one who hasn't trusted idols, he hasn't, he hasn't made unkept promises, he hasn't told lies. He's the perfect son of God, fully human, but fully divine. The only, the one and only, the only person who had these qualifications to ascend to God, to stand on the holy ground of God, was Jesus Christ. John 13, 31 and 32 says, So when he had gone out, and we're speaking of Judas Iscariot at the Last Supper, Jesus said this, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. And then through uniting us in him, through Jesus Christ, he shares his glory with us. And he himself, of course, continues to be glorified in these great works. He's such a wise God. He has this all figured out. He's got it all planned. He's, he's, he's atoned for it all, certainly uh, for the most on the cross, that he would bring back this, this, this relationship that he originally designed when he created us. He created us to have this relationship to stand with him, to approach his throne of glory. 2 Thessalonians 1.12 says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him and according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This Jesus who knew no sin becomes our salvation by grace through faith. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In relationship with him. The righteousness of, if that doesn't humble you, if that doesn't cause you to bow down, if that doesn't grip you with everything that is within you, you are being desensitized, you are being distracted, you are being deceived, and you're headed for destruction. The righteousness of God. The only chance that we have of ascending the hill to God's holy throne of standing on his holy ground and being in his presence is through the atoning work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross at Calvary. We were, and in Christ, of course, we receive the blessing of the king of glory, his own blessing, because then we are able to have clean hands. We're able to be pure of heart. As he continues to, to, the Holy Spirit is abiding in us. I pray all the time, Lord, quicken your spirit within me. Don't, 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 we, don't be going dormant and, and let, let my flesh man rise up and, and take, take, take uh, precedence once again like it used to. Because then you know what? All I'm going to do is go seeking happiness that's going to be fleeting and empty and, and it's going to leave me wanting. But, but, but bring me back into your glory, into your presence where I find fulfillment in life. Where I understand, I know I, why I exist, I know my purpose and I'm living in it, and I'm having fun, and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Thank you, Jesus. So he who qualifies to ascend the hill of God and stand on his holy ground, we get to receive a blessing, verse 5 tells us. Blessing from the Lord, this righteousness, this righteousness of his salvation. People don't, it's really, isn't it amazing? Yet, very believe, this is what they're seeking for. 
This is what the person left on their own. This is what they're seeking for. And that's why those that don't know it or don't realize it need to be reminded or told about it. Even if they don't want to believe it, we need to keep proclaiming the truth. I, j just because this place, there, I see a lot of empty seats here. And it grieves my, my heart as a pastor of a local church. Of course, we'd like to see them full. We'd like to see things expanding and exploding. But because they're not, I'm telling you right here, I will never change the message coming out of this pulpit. Ever. And I also believe that one day these seats will be filled up. And this place will be packed out when people finally come to the revelation of who God is and the recognition of who they are apart from Christ and who they can be in relationship to him. He describes those receiving blesses, blessing and righteousness only in that relationship. And he references it in verse 6. As he says, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Now Jacob here, I believe it's not specifically talking about Jacob, but it's in reference to the covenant that he had with the people of Israel as Jacob was Israel. And Israel is referred to as Jacob, referencing the patriarch of that great nation. He describes those who are to receive blessing and righteousness. And it's those, he says it here, that every generation that continues to focus on the main thing being the main thing. I don't, I'm not here, I, I don't know. Did they have less distractions back then than we do now? I, I think it looks a lot different, but I think the distraction was just the same. People are people. People have always been people. They're always going to be people. Thankfully, God is who he is. He's always going to be God. And, 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 and apart from God, people are going to go running after, being distracted and pursuing everything and everything to try to find that happiness when really what they're seeking is joy and fulfillment and knowing why they even exist. What? what? I don't know if any of you have ever been to your point in your life. It's like, wh wh why, do I, why do I even exist? If you haven't, listen to me. You never have to go there. You exist to glorify God. Young people, let me give you a shortcut. You exist. You're alive. You're breathing so that your life can glorify God. Those of you that are wondering and seeking happiness, stop. Sk hit the brakes. Seek the face of God who created you and who loved you enough to send his only begotten son, that he might give you life abundantly here and for eternity forevermore. We are created to glorify God. Every generation that pursues him, they're keeping the main thing as the main thing. And then he goes into verses 7 and 9, and he, he repeats himself. And whenever we see these repetitions in the word of God, it's not, because, it's not because the writer didn't hear them the first time. It's not because the Holy Spirit stuttered. It's because there needs to be emphasis on what is being said here. I want to emphasize. So in verses 7 and 9, he says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Trust me, this is what we want. We want the King of glory to come into our lives. We need the king of glory in our lives. And so we lift up our heads. We lift up our everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. The king of glory coming in. Whether it's, whether it's that Ark of the Covenant that was entering into Jerusalem at the time David was king. Whether it was the prophetic announcement of Jesus in his triumphal entry when he was coming into Jerusalem on, on that Palm Sunday. Or whether it's God simply inviting a person to come into relationship with him by opening the gates of their souls and the doors of their hearts that possibly could be shut up and closed for, for a whole host of reasons. But it's upon that gentle voice of the Holy Spirit. That tugging of the Holy Spirit. You know, God first loved us while we were yet sinners. No one can claim, I, 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 I'm grateful I found God. I, I, I've said it myself. But the truth of the matter is God first founded, he found me. God finds us. He speaks to us. He allows circumstances in our life to take place that, 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 that no matter what, we come to the revelation of who he is. That's his desire. It's his desire. It's part of, it's part of the glory that, that he exudes. And so upon hearing and responding to the voice of the Holy Spirit, 
We, we lift our gates. Think of these ancient gates where uh, the cities were surrounded by these walls with these gates and, and someone would approach it and they'd have to state or declare or even have a herald that would say, it's so-and-so coming in. And the gates would rise up. The gates would rise. The doors would open and they would let them come in. Who is this king of glory? He stands at the door and knocks. As Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Who is this king of glory? In verse 8, he tells us that he is strong and he's mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. I don't know if what everybody is going through, but our family came through another recent struggle. And I tell you, we're going to struggle with this fallen world until the Lord takes us. And I am more than ready because you know why? We have the king of glory on our side. He fights our battles. He goes before us. He makes a way where there is no way. It's about trusting him. Not to get distracted when things get a little bit uncomfortable or, or, or not nice or not, or not, not always fun. I said you can have fun. I didn't say life is going to be fun every minute of every day. That, that's, that's, that's another gospel that's, not, that's being preached and it's not getting preached here. Yes, you can have fun, but it's not fun all the time. Anybody here had fun every day of your life so far? No. Not even the, not even the children can say that. No, there's some days that aren't, aren't fun, right? Who is this king of glory? Amazing, these statements that he has already made that are stamped forever in the annals of history. The victory at the Red Sea. And Moses led the nation of Israel in that song of victory. And, and in Exodus 15, 1 and 3, it, it, rec it says that I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The Lord is my strength and my song. And verse 3 says, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. God will go to war for you. He will go to battle for you. We look at the victory of Goliath in 1 Samuel 17 and 47, and it says, Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. Yes, David gets all the glory, so to speak, for the story of, the story of David and Goliath. The story of David and Goliath. It should be the story of God's revealed glory. It really, God's revealed glory because it says, for the battle is the Lord's, David said, and he will give you into our hands. David was not trusting the sling. He was not trusting the stones. He was not trusting his ability. It was obvious. He was trusting in the Lord who would fight the battle for them. If we are going through our, this is the blessing of righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus. When we're going through difficulties, when we're going through hardships, when we're going through battles, the Lord of glory, the King of glory will fight your battle for you. He, he wants to bring you into victory. And of course, we've got the ultimate victory that we remind ourselves at the front of this platform. We remind you can see it on the way out. It's about the message of the cross. Foolishness to them that are perishing. But to us, it's the power of God unto salvation. It reveals the greatest victory that this world has ever, ever seen. In Colossians 2.15, Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them when he went to that cross and shed his innocent blood for you and me. Finally, in verse 10, who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You know, people were asking the same thing during Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when he was riding on that donkey. Matthew 21, 10. And he had come to into Jerusalem. All the city was moved saying, who, who is this? He is the Lord of hosts. And hosts in the Hebrew, it literally means armies. The king of glory is the host of all of the armies of heaven. When we talk about who's going to battle for us, who has already given us the greatest victory that we could ever experience, and we take our eyes off of him when we're facing the difficulties of this life, stop carving false images. Stop trusting and depending on yourselves or someone else or some new idea that has come up in, in, in recently. Put your whole and total trust in the king of glory as described between these covers. 
That's the king of glory. He commands the armies of heaven. He's the supreme authority and power over the enemy, over any principality and power, over every wickedness in any high place, over any rulers of darkness, ultimately your enemy, and ultimately why we struggle and we battle and we get distracted. Remember who the Lord is. He's the king of glory. I'm here to remind us how worthy he is, how worthy and deserving the king of glory is. Stand with me as I ask Jay to come and close. I want to continue to look into how, okay, okay, I'm, I'm created to glorify God. How, how do we do that, Pastor? And this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at, it's, it's, it's a loving reminder. Remember the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And so I, I, I want to keep looking at the main thing again and again and again. It's the purpose of life. It's where we find fulfillment. It's, it's where, we, where we come to understand what life is all about. Again, of course, it's not that we add to his glory. You cannot add to God's glory. He's as glorious as he, as he ever is going to be. Now the revelation of his glory is going to be greater. It's going to be intense. He's coming back again. How many believe he's coming back again? And he is going to reveal, amen, that God is coming back. And he's going to reveal his glory like he never has. There is going to be no doubt. I get, there will be no atheists. I guarantee you of that. There will be no unbelievers at that time when God reveals his complete and full glory. So we can't add to it, but we're created to recognize it, to acknowledge it, to honor it, ultimately to, ref to reflect it, as, as I've mentioned. And, and in doing all of those things, we end up glorifying God. We end up fulfilling the very reason why we're here, why he extends our life on this earth. He's the king of glory, and he's worthy and deserving of all of it, of all of it. So it's going to take our attention. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take, sometimes it's even going to take sacrifice. Oh, but there's such fulfillment in sacrifice. We realize it's better to give than to receive. That's what, that's what being in a relationship with God is all about. As we glorify God, God pours out more of his glory in and through our lives. What doesn't make sense in the natural and to the flesh is what absolutely makes sense when it comes to the absolute truth and what comes to God moving in and through our lives. I just want to pray a prayer of blessing over us and, and we're going to watch this video before. I hope that you can stay for this, this brunch. We've got a scratch kitchen right here in Stonebridge Church. And uh, I, I just pray that you'd consider how we can bless this, this ministry. But, but before we look at this promotion video, let, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's go to the God and in, in just uh, let's give him glory. Let's give him glory right now with, with, with reverence, with honor. Father, we, we give you glory this morning. We unite ourselves together, one spirit, one mind, one accord. And we glorify you this morning. We, we place you at the very throne of our life. Let thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, dear God. And Lord, may you continue to do a work in us, Lord. May you continue to call us closer. Those, those that don't know you, that they'd come to repentance as a sinner. Asking you to, to forgive them. Believing that you sent Jesus to die on a cross for their sins, to pay the full penalty for their sins, to become that propitiation. You appeased the full wrath of God for every sin that you will ever commit. And then you walk in that grace, in that glory, God's presence, as you put your total and complete faith and trust in him. For those that have fell away and they find themselves being distracted and drifting, listen, 
God's going to chase you. Listen, you, we're, we're, we're to pursue him and we'll live that fulfilled, glorious life. But if you are getting distracted, if you're pursuing happiness elsewhere, listen, God's pursuing you and he's speaking to you right now and he's telling you to turn around, son. Turn around, daughter. Come unto me. Ascend back unto the hill. Come and stand with me on holy ground as you, as you repent and put your trust and faith in Christ. Lord, give us the strength as you go and battle for us, Lord, in our difficulties and the circumstances and hardships that we might face. God, bring us through victorious as you've done so many times before. Give us a testimony that we'll have some more of your glory to reveal to others who we come across. Father, we thank you that you share your glory with us and simply ask us to live our lives to glorify you. We do that this morning collectively as the body of Christ and as your covenant people. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen.